Uh, our next presenter is Marcin. Uh, I've worked with Marcin for a long time. Uh, we worked together at Medium uh, before I joined Figma, and then, and then Marcin came by uh, afterwards. And I've spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours talking with Marcin about the most minute details of everything uh, that we work on. Uh, and that's just the nature of work, right? Is this, what, whatever product you work on, uh, people probably think it's pretty simple from the outside, but then when you actually do the work, it's much, much, much more complicated uh, on the inside. And so, you know, people always ask us things like, hey, uh, you know, uh, how come I can't just like push a button and make a website with, uh, you know, with the design? And well, I've, I mean, obviously you guys in the room know that's hard, but you know, I get that a lot. Uh, you know, folks, designers sometimes ask things like, what's up with frames and groups? Like, why are they different? And it's like, well, you know, I don't know, it's complicated. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, all of these, Things are very difficult for us to think through. We spend a lot of time thinking through it, even the most minute details. And so Marcin is going to tell us a story about one of these minute details about Command B. Hi. <laughs> so um, about a year ago, one of our users filed a bug. And it's basically, I've been noticing that my Command B board doesn't quite work. And particularly, like, it works for Roboto, doesn't work for a font called Chalkboard. So basically, what the person was saying, you know, I can select Roboto, it works really well when I press Command-B, but when I do it for Chalkboard, nothing happens, right? And it's, you know, one of those bugs that happen, and I got a hold of it, and of course, my first response is, why are you using Chalkboard? Uh, <laughs> there's so many better fonts out there, but it's actually an interesting bug, it turns out, and I want to walk you a little bit through like, what actually happens when you press Command B, and why is, why is it much more complicated than you might imagine. First of all, it's not just bold anymore, right? Uh, fonts used to be maybe normal and bold and maybe italic somewhere there, but sometime down the road they added light, and eventually a lot of fonts today have actually weights that go way below light and way above bold which a lot of you, I suppose, are familiar with, but I sort of very deliberately hid the names of all the other weights because I'm actually curious, without looking, can you name them, right? So we're gonna do like a little bit of like a room thing. So I, let's say you have a font that has a weight of extra light and it has a weight of thin, right? It has two weights. Which one is thinner without looking it up? Okay, who thinks extra light is thinner than thin? Maybe raising your hand. Okay, quite a few people. Who thinks thin is thinner than extra light? More people think that. Okay, turns out for most fonts, thin is thinner than extra light. Okay, the next one, which one is thinner? <laughs> semi-bold or demi-bold, right? Who thinks it's semi-bold? Okay, it's a handful of hands. Who thinks it's demi-bold? Super interesting. They're supposed to be exactly the same. Um, <laughs> Some fonts just call it semi-bold, some fonts just call it demi -bold. Okay, the last one I want to try. Which one is thinner, book or regular? Who thinks it's book? Okay, who thinks it's regular? Okay, thank you. The answer is nobody knows. Um, <laughs> these are the nine most common weights of fonts with their names, but the funny thing is they all have alternatives, right? And you might have seen some of them. Light is sometimes called demi and sometimes it's called book. Normal is sometimes called book and sometimes it's called regular and black is called heavy and extra bold is called ultra bold and thin, I love this name, hairline, extra light becomes ultra light and of course we talked about semi bold becoming demi bold and it's not even counting all the pronunciations of semi bold and demi bold. So that's already pretty tricky, right? Just that very one thing. The funny thing is we've been there before. I don't know how many of you know this, but about a century ago, or even more than that, all the, f oh yeah, by the way, this is a font that could literally happen because it's up to a type designer to choose whatever names they want for different font weights, right? So if somebody wants to troll me really hard, make a font like this, right? But we've actually been there before. We solved this problem once in typography and it had to do with font sizes. So I don't know how many of you know, font sizes used to be names as well. Right? So there's all of these names that, and at some point people thought like, you know what's even better than names? Numbers, so let's do that. But if we hadn't done that, you could sort of imagine Figma being like this, where all the fonts were names you had to memorize, right? And I think some of those names are pretty cool. Three points is Excelsior, which I feel like Craig Mott would appreciate. Um, you know, Brevier, Minion, or whatever. Fortunately, we figured it out. 
we change it to numbers, numbers are much easier to deal with, right? And the same sort of thing happens under the hood, at least for font weights, right? So this is standardized set of numbers going from 100 to 900 at least, and we can tap into that so we don't have to deal with names. Except, even if you have all the numbers, it gets tricky. Imagine you have a font with you know, nine weights, and you press Command B. What should Figma do? In this case, it's pretty simple. 400 usually is regular, 700 is usually bold. You press Command B, jumps from one to the other. Right? It's pretty simple. Even if some of the weights are not available, it's still pretty OK, because you just jump from 400 to 700. Even if it's just 400, 700, that's almost the obvious one thing to do. But what happens when you have 400 and 800? Right? What if somebody just installed those two weights? So at Figma, we do this thing where we sort of relax it a little bit. We say if it's within 100, we're still going to do the thing. So if it's 400, 800, if it's 600, it's still going to work. It's not going to get as bold as you might imagine when you press Command B. It's still going to work. How about 900? That seems pretty far. We actually don't do that, right? That feels a little bit too far. And it goes in really weird inter directions. Like, what if you have only 600 and 800? We have to think about that, right? So in this case, we choose the one that's a little bit further because you kind of just want to go bold, right? In the same way, when you go from 700 and 400, it's not available, we're going to go to 300. And what's actually really interesting, we found people reported what's really disturbing is if you press Command B and you press it again and nothing happens, right? There's this trust that you have in Command B being reversible. So we also have to think about that. And it gets interesting when you have different widths of the font, right? If you have a condensed one and not, of course, when you press Command B now, it's going to just jump within the same width. But if we don't, what if the only bolt for that font is condensed? Should we go there or not? And we do. I'm not sure if that's the right decision, because it is kind of weird, right? Check this out. It gets bold, but it also gets thinner. So we do that. If there's no other weights available in the current width, we go there. We're not going to go there for italic. It's super weird when you press Command B and something gets italic. We learn it the hard way. So, and it's just like scratching the surface of this. So we have like literally pages of algorithms to do that kind of stuff. The other thing that some people might ask in the room and some people ask us routinely is, well, what if I only have 400? Can you just sort of make it bold, right? Like, just make it thicker, right? <laughs> like, what's the big deal? The deal is kind of big, right? I mean, a lot of people here know this, right? Bold is not just making things thicker. Bold is actually drawing every letter form to make it look appealing and in sync with the rest of the font. If you compare those four letters in regular and bold, they change quite a bit. If you take seven in surveyor text, which is one of my favorite fonts, and map it from light to black, the whole proportion of a letter changes. Right? It's not just something goes thick in a very rudimentary way. And if you take that seven, and if you make it thick, it's almost the exact opposite of what you want. Right? This is super gross, by the way. Um, you know, typographers call it a faux, fake, synthesized typeface, right? And it's not just bold. Uh, here is an example of like a fake bold looking pretty bad and regular bold looking gorgeous, but it's also superscript. Right? There is a huge difference between a superscript that's just programmatic and superscript that's actually designed by a font designer. Same thing with small caps. Right? So even that can be already a little bit complicated. And then fonts now come from different places. Right? You have a set of fonts on your computer that come with your operating system. That's pretty obvious. Uh, it's also pretty obvious to everybody here that you can install your own font on a computer, and then you get this bucket of fonts that you just put is a traditional way to put fonts on your computer. But Figma also has about 1,000 Google fonts that come for free. So you had this big bucket. Um, and then Figma installs a few fonts on its own, Inter, Font Awesome, a, a few popular ones. So you already have a little bit of a complex situation. And it's not complex just because you have these four silos. It's because those four silos look like this. You can have a font that's installed locally that's also a Google font. Or you can also have a font that Figma installs that you also insert yourself. And Figma now has to choose the right one. And it's often not the most obvious thing to do, which one is the one you want. Because for some people, it might look like this. For some people, for example, in the Chromebook, it's pretty simple. It also changes per person. 
right? And that's why in the font picker we announced today, we're gonna make it a little bit more obvious where the fonts are coming from, just to make it a little bit less confusing without going all the way into like really, really intense font management. And then we get multiplayer. And that's the thing I hope people, you know, a lot of us love at least doing multiplayer, but it complicates my life. <laughs> because imagine you, capital D designer, just having purchased the brand new spanking, like clean Helvetica 2020. The best version of Helvetica there is, open type features, variable font, all the licenses, all of the versions, it's meticulous. You install it, Figma picks it up, you start editing a file, you use Helvetica, you're happy, and you invite somebody to collaborate with you. They also have Helvetica, that's awesome. Except they have a Helvetica that just sort of fell off the back of a truck in 1997. <laughs> to both of you, this is Helvetica, right? Figma just reports it's Helvetica. But the funny thing that can happen in this situation is like, what if the other Helvetica has a different set of metrics, right? This can happen. What if this other Helvetica is missing a letter? When you press Command-B, something disappears. Maybe not G, not very likely, but there are other letters. Right? So suddenly we have all of these sets of problems. Right? And we try to solve it with a feature we call shared fonts, where if you're an organization, you can actually upload a font to your whole organization. Right? If you have the right license, you can put it inside Figma, Figma will then just seamlessly give it to everybody in your team or in your organization, depending on how you want it, right? And in a new font picker, we're actually gonna tell you it's coming from your organization, that's great. Except, you know where I'm going with this? Well, now we introduce another silo that overlaps other silos, and Figma has to figure out, you know, what if you have a shared font that's also a Google font, that's also a local font for some people on a team. And it's not obvious sometimes what to do. For example, what if you have a Google font that has regular, medium, and bold, and then you install a shared font that's the same font, but it has black weight? And the sort of most obvious thing to imagine is like Figma should just combine them, right? You get like more weights. But the thing is that like, this first version of a font could be 1.0, the second version of the font could be local, special font, or whatever. So we actually do the thing that's not the most intuitive, which is we assume that you know what you're doing, and we're just gonna take the Google font away which works for most people, but it's really hard to explain. Um, imagine a situation where you have two people on the team, one person is designing on Windows, one person is designing on a Chromebook, they're both designing a UI that's meant to be used on Mac OS, and they enter an emoji. Which emoji should show up? <laughs> we actually don't know often. Like, should it be the platform emoji? Should it be the Mac OS emoji? You know, should it be one of those new Twitter emojis that were just announced? I don't know, we have to figure it out, but it's one of those things that happen when you have multiple people using different platforms collaborating on one document. And then there's this. Fonts actually lie quite a lot. So all of the fonts are supposed to come with metadata, right? With all of these numbers and descriptions telling you exactly what this font is supposed to be outside of how it looks. And it's a thing that we use a lot to make decisions. But the data is super messy. For example, a lot of fonts report line height in three different ways for all sorts of historical reasons, and often they disagree, but we have to pick one. Another thing that we had to do with at some point earlier last year, I wanted to do this experiment trying to solve a particular problem, which is what if you want to typeset something in a different language, right? You probably want to know which, font, which exactly fonts support your language completely, right? So this is a Polish pangram. And if you don't have a font that supports Polish, this could look something like this, which is awful, right? It wouldn't be nice if Figma showed you Polish fonts. And so I did this experiment where I took all of the fonts that I had, all of the Google fonts, a bunch of test fonts, and I wrote an algorithm just to look at the metadata that the fonts have telling you which languages they support, right? A font should just tell you, yeah, I'm good with Polish or I'm, I'm not. Super easy, right? It wasn't. It turned out that not all of the fonts are truthful. And I actually have a question, like what do you think was the number? Do you think only 80% fonts reported their locale truthfully? Or do you think it was even worse? Just 60%, right? So like maybe by show of hands, come, it's actually 0%. It's horrible. <laughs> There's literally no way to ask a font what languages it supports and have it truthfully reported. It's impossible. 
even though there's three sets of metadata that's supposed to do just that, you literally have to like check every character by hand and see if it's there. That's the kind of stuff we're up against. And for example, at some point, um, we change, we recognize that italics are less important in, type, in UI design, right? I think many of you have seen it. Like, we really care a lot about bold and light. Italics are less important for the kind of stuff most people do at Figma. So we actually switch the order in the font picker, right? The, the weights go up, italics go below. It actually helps a little bit understand. We, I think, let me know if you like it. I like it personally. I think it's a step in the right direction, but it puts a pressure on us to know whether a font is italic with more certainty. And for example, how many of you know SF Mono? Great font. You know what happened in one version of SF Mono? It has an italic angle of 180 degrees. I don't know what it means. What it means in our UI is that everything's italic except for some reason heavy. Apple is not returning my phone calls. We actually had to add this clause in the code that says, like, it's not a 180, it's zero. It doesn't make any sense, right? Some fonts say they're italic, but then they say they're not italic. And then we have this set of algorithms that say, like, basically, if a font has an italic in the name, we're going to assume it is italic, even though it says it's not italic. But now we're back to this, this whole mess that we try to avoid, which is looking at names of fonts and make decisions based on names and not metadata. And so suddenly, pressing command B is all of those things at the same time, which is a little overwhelming. Suddenly, all of my Figma files look like this. <laughs> which, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know what it means. Suddenly, fonts for me is this and this, all of these bugs, rather than the thing that I used to love, which is going to Surveyor Text and selecting seven and just marveling at how gorgeous it looks. This is not my job. My job is this. My job is this. Um, we have a room in our office that's called Be Bold. It has nothing to do with typography, but I walk past it every day and it sort of feels a little personal. <laughs> you know what also feels personal? Guess who is the only person today who had a typo in their talk title in a written program? <laughs> I don't know if you can spot it. I know it's a hard character, it's Unicode, whatever, but it's a little sad, it's a little annoying. <laughs> um, but I'm not here to complain, actually. That's the thing. Like, it's, it would be very easy for me to blame font designers for having wrong metadata, but there's reasons that tools do it that way. It would be easy for me to blame people for like, sort of not caring about their fonts enough or doing weird stuff, but like, people just want to use Figma and they just want to use Bold. And I think I'm not even going to say, like, I feel privileged to help you design type. Like, it's a job. Like, that's my job. That's our job to make this work. Um, it's just a job, and it sometimes feels very overwhelming, which brings us back to this. <laughs> I've been noticing that my command bolt keys behaving differently than before. And so our great support team, as they always do, goes with, talks to the person, tries to figure out what's going on. Are you using a desktop of our website? Because we actually handle fonts slightly differently. Desktop app. Uh, we're sorry. We know it's weird, would you mind restarting? It's so obvious, so cliche, but it helps. Didn't help, okay. Do you happen to use shared fonts in your organization? Sometimes, okay, no, okay. Third party font manager, they also make things complicated. Do you have local versions of Roboto and Chalkboard? You do, would you mind sending us to us so we can verify the metadata because maybe your fonts are a little shady? They actually look good and we're sort of scraping the bottom of the barrel here, do you have any other programs? Suddenly the command B starting to feel pretty complicated, right? This very simple bug. The funny thing that happens, and it doesn't happen very often, the user comes back to us and says, I actually figured it out. You know, three weeks later. <laughs> uh, it took us a while to like, go through all of these questions. And the funny thing is that the answer was staring us in the face the whole time. I don't know how many of you can already see this. There's two clues. One, it used to work. Two, January 9, 2019. I solved the mystery here. It's my MacBook. <laughs> Super disappointing in a way. Because you don't assume that's the thing that's going to break. It's all of these other things that we, we own are supposed to break. Command B, I don't know how many of you know this, in all of the Figma shortcuts, Command B is the oldest shortcut. 
is the shortcut that goes back to 1973 to Xerox Alto, where you could press Control B and make something bold. You don't assume that's the thing that's gonna break, right? A little sad. But why I'm telling you all of this is because I think it's important to tell those kind of stories, right? How many of you know this saying, if you can understand a city, that city is dead? I know how many of you walked around this area. It's a super weird area, right? But it's filled with all of these things that don't make sense until you start asking questions, right? Why is this called dog patch? Why is this train called K when it goes this way, but T when it goes this way? Why is there a creek that sort of ends and doesn't go anywhere further? Why, just a few blocks away from here, is my favorite intersection of the city? If you know anything about urban design, this doesn't make any sense. Those streets are not supposed to be near each other, let alone intersect, and yet they do. I encourage you to figure out why. <laughs> and you think like, oh yeah, cities, whatever, right? We're technology, we're data-driven, we're numbers, right? Some time ago, we started noticing there's a lot of fonts that have font weight 999, and we're like, what? Doesn't make any sense. What happened was at some point we extended from 900 to 1000, but a lot of the font handling things assumed three digits, three digits only. So they couldn't use 1,000 because it would, it would be zero. Remember Y2K? So people started using 999. <laughs> so extra black was 999, and that's something we now have to put in our code because otherwise you can't go to 1,000. And so this, is going to look even worse. This is going to become this when we start adding variable fonts and, and other things. This is going to be other things that we don't even, don't even think what they're going to be. If you can understand a city, that city is dead. You can understand your design system. Maybe your design system is obsolete. If you can understand typography, maybe typography doesn't matter anymore. Right? And I think that's what keeps me sane. Like, you have to tell those stories to remember, because otherwise everything is completely arbitrary. It doesn't make any sense. But one interesting thing in the context of Figma is also this. Of course, typography is changing. Of course, there's going to be variable fonts. There's going to be other things. I'm super excited for them. But remember when I showed you small caps, fake small caps and real small caps? How many of you were at this moment were like, they both look OK? What's the big deal, right? Like people who use Figma, they think of typography probably slightly differently than people who use other design tools 10 and 20 years ago. And we have to start thinking about that maybe fake small caps is okay, right? I know it's a sacrilege, I'm a typographer, but maybe that's okay. Like maybe people actually don't wanna look at fonts like software. They don't wanna update them, they don't wanna fix their bugs, they just wanna use them, right? Maybe people don't wanna manage fonts. Some of us will do, some of us will love that, but this whole idea of Figma expanding design means that fonts mean different things to different people, and maybe this, it's not such a big deal. Like, if somebody wants to use chalkboard, you can look at it as like, oh my god, so lame. But you can also look at it as just like, holy shit, somebody cares about fonts now. Maybe we need to talk to them about chalkboard at some point in their life. <laughs> but this is kind of awesome. So, one of the things I'm most proud of at Figma is none of the like, really big things. Is the, th is the reason that we didn't call our open type features open type feature or advanced type. We just call it type details because it just feels a little bit more friendly. And when you hover over small caps, we just tell you, like, we're sorry, the font doesn't have that. It's not your fault. Maybe it's our fault. We can talk about that. It's just that. So it's just like we have to think about typography in a slightly different ways. And I hope, you know, basically what I want to say, like, please press Command B and hold me or us accountable. Right? That's just our job, and we're going to try to figure out how to make it work the best way possible. And it's regardless of whether you use Windows or a Chromebook, whether you use like the worst keyboard ever made, or these amazing switches from 1973, <laughs> or whether you're Craig Mod, carefully typesetting your slide, we just found it, um, you know, with this gorgeous typography, or whether you just want to use chalkboard. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>